We're exactly halfway through season two, and boy did this episode show it. The action that some viewers were complaining was missing from this season came at us full force. But before we get into the climactic battle that concluded the episode, there's quite a lot of material to cover prior. A running theme throughout this episode was Damon losing his grip on reality the longer he stays at Heron Hall. In the vision that begins the episode, Damon is once again faced with young Rhaenyra, but she is wearing the crown and royal garb that her adult self dons. When she berates Damon, accusing him of being jealous of her since she held more of Viserys' love, he slays her on the spot. This sequence gives us a lot of insight into Damon's character, showing us the deep insecurities he holds that are preventing him from properly serving Rhaenyra. Additionally, it's worth noting that, in his Harrenhal visions, he always sees Rhaenyra as a child, showing that he perhaps still views her as such, despite her growth as a leader in person. Later in the episode, Damon finds himself in the throes of another vision, one in which he is chasing a person that appears from behind to be himself. However, when that person turns around, it is revealed to indeed be Damon, but wearing Aemon's signature eye patch. I believe this symbolizes Damon's burgeoning guilt for the murder of Aegon's baby son Jaehaerys, placing himself on the same level as Aemon, who murdered Rhaenyra's son Lucerys at the end of last season. As members of the Green Faction's council mention, Harrenhal does have a reputation for being cursed or haunted in some capacity. However, Damon's second encounter with Alice Rivers sheds a little more truth on the matter. Emerging from his visions, Damon finds himself in Alice's workshop of sorts, where she seems to be crafting a slew of potions. In their conversation, she reveals quite a lot about herself. Despite Harrenhal being her home, she is not a member of the Strong family proper, but a bastard. Though the most obvious answer would be that she is Lionel's daughter, note that she doesn't explicitly say who her father was. Perhaps she isn't from this generation of Strongs at all. She explains that, though she is not a maester herself, she essentially took on the role after the last maester fled the castle in the middle of the night. When Damon questions why he departed, Alice hints at a very similar situation to what Damon is is currently experiencing. She then gives us a step toward clarity on why exactly Damon is struggling with his slip from reality. She explains that Heron Hall was built on top of what used to be a grove of weirwood trees. If you recall from Game of Thrones, weirwood trees are major conduits for magic and visions. Here, Alice explains that the souls of the dead live on inside these trees. Since the bed Damon has been sleeping in is made from the wood of said trees, Alice infers that it may be the cause of his intense visions. Alice herself seems to know quite a lot about Damon, his past up to this point, and even his current internal struggles. Could she be in touch with the weirwood network? able to glimpse at or even manipulate the visions Damon is experiencing directly? When Damon has just about had enough of her strangeness, she offers him a drink, claiming it will help him sleep better. However, immediately upon taking a sip, the magical haze he is in sharply worsens, and he emerges what could be hours or perhaps even days later. Currently, I hold two possible theories as to what this beverage may have been. Given the prominent discussion of weirwood-based magic Alice elaborates on right before giving Damon the drink, my leading theory is that she gave him weirwood paste. In the main A Song of Ice and Fire book series, when in the Cave of the Three-Eyed Raven, Bran is given this drink by the Children of the Forest. It causes him to be much more enveloped in his visions, even allowing him to travel through time in a sense. My alternate theory is that perhaps Alice gave Damon Shade of the Evening, a powerful potion that comes from the far reaches of the eastern continent of Essos. In the main of Song of Ice and Fire book series, Daenerys is given this beverage by the warlocks of Karth, and it floods her with a chaotic frenzy of visions as well. Though I lean toward the prior simply given the context clues, the latter is still most definitely a possibility given the effects of the drink we are shown. Damon's slip from reality throughout this episode coincided with his immense difficulty at rallying the Riverlands under the Black Faction banner. Early in the episode, he met with Oscar Tully, the grandson of Grover Tully, the Lord of Riverrun and the ruler of the Riverlands. Do you happen to notice a naming scheme between all the Tullys that have been mentioned? Grover himself is still too ill and disabled to rally the houses of the Riverlands together, and his grandson Oscar refuses to act without the express permission that his grandfather simply is not well enough to give. This leaves Damon to have to meet with the various Riverland houses one by one to gain their support, a process that is simply way too time consuming with the Green Faction forces already on the march. Later in the episode, still fighting the throes of his magical haze, Damon meets with Will and Blackwood. If you recall, the Blackwoods are the rival house of the Brackens, the both of whom fought each other under the banners of the Black and Green factions respectively at the outset of the previous episode. Willem recalls that he once vied for Rhaenyra's hand in marriage, likely making him the grown-up version of the Blackwood child that slayed a Bracken for her honor early in Season 1. He promises Daemon his forces, but only if the Black faction destroys the Brackens with their dragons. Daemon isn't the only Black faction leader struggling their way through this episode. Early on, we see Rhaenys at the shipyard of Driftmark speaking with Alan of Hull for the first time. She admires his looks, but is quickly interrupted by the arrival of Corlys, who sends Alan away. Here, we are finally given a bit more context as to why Corlys has been so weird about Alan. Rhaenys all but explicitly says that Alan is Corlys' bastard son. This seems to be a situation that she already knew about, as she expresses clear frustration that Corlys never told her it was Alan that saved his life during the war in the Stepstones. Rhaenys tries to persuade her husband to honor
honor Alan and raise him up as a true member of House Valerion in honor of his achievements, but Corlys rejects this prospect. Who knows, after Rhaenys' fate at the end of this episode, perhaps he'll take more of a consideration to her wishes. On the other side of the water over in King's Landing, the Green Faction is a mess as usual. We see that Alicent ordered Grandmaster Orwell to brew her moon tea, which, if you recall from Season 1, is this world's abortion medicine. This tells us that Kristen must have impregnated her prior to his departure from the city. If Larys didn't already know of Alicent's affair with Kristen, he most definitely does now, as he spots the moon tea vial when visiting her room. Though Larys attempts to use his typical slimy way of getting into her head, Allison seems fed up with his shit, explicitly telling him off multiple times throughout their conversation. With how unstable we know Larys to be, we'll have to see where her resistance to his methods leads. Allison being fed up with bullshit definitely doesn't just apply to Larys, however. She harshly talks some sense into Aegon too, who, after being embarrassed by Aemon at his small council meeting, throws a fit. In that council meeting, Aemon revealed that he has been plotting with Kristen Cole all along behind the scenes, setting up battle plans and military strategy without the knowledge or approval of Aegon. Rather than going straight to Harrenhal, to take it back from Damon, Aemon and Cole's strategy has been to continue taking small castles along the Crown Lands coast, effectively blocking off Dragonstone from sending ground forces over to the mainland of Westeros. We see an example of this process when Kristen takes Duskendale and beheads the defiant leader of House Darklyn, whom we later find out was the father of a member of Rhaenyra's council. When Aegon attempts to assert his authority and change Aemon and Cole's plan, Aemon embarrasses him in High Valerian so his council wouldn't comprehend. Still, the council seems to understand the dynamic of the situation all too well, since Aegon's High Valerian skills are shown to be obviously very rough. Alicent tries her best to smack some sense into Aegon, stating that he should be grateful for the advice of his advisors rather than resentful. However, she seals her harshness by saying that he should do nothing but listen, implying that he should simply be a figurehead while smarter people actually conduct the war and run the kingdom. This harsh advice, however, seems to have the opposite effect on Aegon than intended. Rather than heed it, he doubles down in his frustration, setting off to join the war on Dragonback himself without informing anyone. As battle brews at Rook's Rest, Rhaenyra arrives back on Dragonstone just in time. Much to my surprise, she informs everyone of exactly what she was away doing meeting with Allison directly despite how dangerous of a plan it was. Her counsel clearly expresses displeasure with her brashness, perhaps no one more than her son Jaceres, though his primary motivation is clearly a concern for his mother rather than power for himself. However, this argumentation has to quickly be set aside, as the matter of how to handle Cole's forces closing on a rook's rest is most urgent. At first, Rhaenyra expresses a desire to fly there herself, but her counsel unanimously agrees that it is an incredibly dangerous idea. Being the selfless man that he is, Jaceres offers to fly there in her place, but as Rhaenyra rightly points out, he has too little experience for a battle of this scale. As Rhaenys then confirms herself, she is the only logical choice. There is, however, a bit of a plot hole here. Rhaenys mentions having battle experience. However, we don't know of any war she would have fought in during her lifetime. I would prop this up to being a lie she told to persuade Rhaenyra to send her, but she says the same thing again when talking privately to her dragon. Perhaps she aided Corlys, Lanor, and Daemon during the war on the Stepstones back in Season 1, but we were never shown that. Regardless, however, Rhaenys sets off to battle. In juxtaposition to her and Aegon's Dragovac departures, we see Rhaenyra finally sharing the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy with Jaceres. As a quick refresher from back in Season 1, Aegon the Conqueror, the founder of the Targaryen dynasty, invaded Westeros driven by a prophecy. It essentially states that Westeros must be united under Targaryen rule in order to face the threat from the far north, which we know to be the White Walkers. Though we know this threat won't be arriving until 200 years in the future during the time of Daenerys, Rhaenyra doesn't have that knowledge. In turn, a huge motivator for her continuity of this war is this prophecy, as she seems to wholeheartedly believe that Westeros must be united under her rule in order to face this threat. Since Kregan Stark seemed to express similar understanding and concern during Jaceres' visit back in the season premiere, I wonder if Jace will connect the dots between these two conversations. With all else out of the way, let's dive into the Battle of Rook's Rest. We quickly find out that Cole and Aemond had already anticipated a Black Fraction dragon entering the fray. In fact, it was all part of their daytime attack plan. While Rhaenys and her dragon arrived and caused destruction unopposed, Aemon was secretly hiding in the woods with his dragon, ready to intercept and defeat her. However, this strategy was interrupted by Aegon's brash arrival on his dragon. This thwarting of his well-calculated plans seemed to be the straw that broke the camel's back for Aemon. All of his bubbling resentment for his brother seemed to come crashing to the surface as, when finally entering the battle, he sets fire not just to Rhaenys, but directly to Aegon himself. With Aegon and his dragon now out of the way, Aemon goes on to kill Rhaenys and her dragon by himself, giving us the first major Black Faction character death of the season. Aemon then descends into the woods where Aegon and his dragon fell, and begins to search for them by foot, sword drawn seemingly to finish Aegon off. However, before he can successfully go through with the murder, he is stopped just in time by Kristen. The episode does a clever job of not fully showing us Aegon's fate before cutting to black, leaving viewers who haven't read the book left not knowing Aegon's condition. Anyway, that about wraps up this breakdown. If there's anything you think I might have missed or any questions you might have, be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see future episode breakdowns, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next week for Season 2, Episode 5.